This week in Physics Twist, the demise of a species that could have been revived, more completely insane space station news, and the loss of one of science's all-time greats. I am your host, Duncan Bell, as Holly is still on leave, and um, good news to our listeners, both of them. Um, This week we're joined by the uh, human embodiment of the 1990s surf brand of the same name, Rusty. Say hello, Rusty. G'day, guys. How's it going? And also, Dr. Quill is back. Hey, guys. What's happening? They can't answer that question. Yeah, they can. (laughs) They can answer it emotionally. So, um, Rusty, we'll start with you. Can you please tell us what you do here and uh, what makes you tick? Well, as you know, my name's Rusty and I'm an educator here at Physics. And in addition to teaching young kids about science and technology and engineering, I also look at fixing things around the place. So I'm a big tech enthusiast. I like to talk about Android and Apple and Microsoft, as well as 3D printers or fixing things in the workshop. Lots of different things. All right, awesome. I have seen your work around the place. It's fantastic. Um, 3D printing is going to come up for us, for sure, Yeah. in this discussion. Um, now, yeah, I asked you to bring in some science and technology stories from the past week, and you have a big old rusty rhino (laughs) (laughs) session, it seems. Um, Can you start us off with that? Yeah, I've got a couple of different stories to do with rhinos, and one of them actually is related to 3D printing, but I'll get into that a bit later. So the first one I want to talk about was, um, in recent news, the last male northern white rhino was euthanized, put down. And that was due to age-related illness, but that only leaves two female white rhinos um, around, alive, and conservationists hope to save the species from extinction using Mm -hmm. some biological material that they got from the last male rhino. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because my my understanding of how this works is that you need both a male and a female. (laughs) It helps. Is that correct? Generally, but um, there are a a bunch of advanced cellular techniques, Mm -hmm. such as IVF, which is... Uh, in vitro fertilization mm-hmm. that can be used um, without having a male and a female of the species around. Yep. Um, you still need the female to be alive, mm-hmm. but the, the male is no longer necessary. <laughs> no longer required. <laughs> Just need his DNA. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, we're no longer needed here. <laughs> well, hopefully that is a, you know, a good way that we can regain this species because it's, it's really sad that mm. that's, that's where we are. Yeah, to. well, I actually wanted to talk a little bit about the, the last male white mm-hmm. rhino. Um, his name was Sudan. Uh, he was referred to as the gentle giant. He was uh, a large animal, but he wasn't mean. He didn't have any sort of aggression in him. And he lived in a conservancy in Kenya called Old Pejeta. Um, and he was put down um, after his degenerative illness became too great. Um, he's survived by his daughter and his granddaughter, uh, Najin and Fatu. And he was uh, 45 when he was put down. Oh, wow. Yeah. Now, my issue is, are these the surviving rhinos they're hoping to now impregnate? Because that's going to become an issue, potentially genetically, right? Because they're family. That is, that is an issue. And to be honest, Quill, we did talk about this before the show and we decided not to bring it up. So. <laughs> <laughs> my bad. <laughs> we'll leave that one there. <laughs> yes, that would be an issue. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, Sudan was born in the early 1970s, and there was a near extinction event in the 1970s that he managed to survive. When you say near extinction event, what was the what was the event? There was a, a large amount of poaching. Mm. Um, so the the number of that species dropped down quite extraordinary low. Um, in 1975, he was taken to Dver Kralov in uh, the Czech Republic, the zoo over there. And at the time, it was the only one in the world where northern white rhinos had successfully given birth. Right, okay. Um, And he lived there until 2009, which is when he came back to Africa. And he's lived at the old Pejeta uh, Conservancy ever since. Yeah, Hmm. okay. So what what was the actual illness that, you know, took him in the end? Uh, well, from the news article that I read, it didn't actually go into it. It just said that it was age-related. He was old. Yeah. Rhinovirus? Oh, yeah, that's good. <laughs> Rhinovirus, yeah. Nice. I had to, that sorry. Was, yeah, really good. 
usually I've been the one sort of pummeling our listeners with bad puns, so it's good <laughs> for like someone else to take time. the reins, as it were. Alrighty. So, um, as, as I said before, uh, before Sudan was euthanized, uh, they managed to get some genetic material collected, mm-hmm. and they're going to try and hopefully use that to not end the species. They mm. want to carry it on. It's Fingers the, crossed. It's not the first species of rhino to... Well, we can't say that this one's extinct, but there have been other species that have been that have gone completely extinct, right? Can anyone I, chime I, in on I'm that? I'm not 100% sure. sure on that either. Okay. Mm-hmm. What, what I might do is find out and then chime in yeah. in, the, in the edit. So we'll, we'll fix it in post is what I'm saying. Yeah. Hello? It's me, Duncan. From a not-too-distant yet non-specific future, I was right. The West African black rhinoceros went extinct in 2011. Goodbye. Goodbye. So um, the northern white rhino has been all but destroyed a few times. Um, first of all, from colonial in the colonial era, uh, due to hunting, mm-hmm. uncontrolled hunting during that time, and the colonial era, era of Africa was between 1881 and 1914, so quite a long time ago, and then more recently, at, from like the mid 1900s to the last few um, years, more from poaching for mm-hmm. their horns. It's been a huge problem, hasn't it? Yes, Absolutely it has. Huge. Yeah. Ridiculous. And the the main sort of um, main species that's been suffering as a result of this. There's poaching. That and elephants as well, yeah. I think, yeah, for their ivory. Which actually brings me on to the second story I wanted to talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, so rhinos are the hardest hit of some of the wildlife for their horns, and it's used a lot in Southeast Asia for um, very intricate carvings and for mm-hmm. some medicines. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's actually... Uh, wanted quite a lot by a lot of different people in that region and they are willing to pay a lot of money for it sometimes thousands of dollars for just a very small amount mm. Um, mm. and there is a company a start biotech startup coming from um, Seattle they're based in Seattle and their name is called Pembient and what they're wanting to do is they want to try and 3d print rhino horns mm. And they're going to 3D print it out of something called keratin. That's the same stuff that your hair and your nails are made out of. Ah, mm. cool. And when they 3D print these horns, they're indistinguishable from real horns. Really? Completely indistinguishable? To, Completely. To the human eye, so I people that buy it, uh, both molecularly and chemically, they are exactly the same. Yep. Okay. Yeah, so, cool. so what happens? They 3D print these um, these horns. Yep. And then, and, and then what? Then they... They push them out into the black market and they try and get people to buy it for quite a, a lot less than what they flood uh, the market. Are. They flood it, um, and by doing so, they drop the price yeah. of the rhino horn. So then and people don't want to poach so much because they're not getting any money. For yeah. It. yeah. So this would mean mm. that poachers don't want to do it because they're not going to get enough money. Mm. Worth. Okay. It's not worth the time and effort. So it's That's the, awesome. Basically, the economics of supply and demand. Yeah, and this actually has a, mm. a name. This is called Gresham's Law. Mm. That's mm. something that you guys can look up at a later date. But it essentially means if you have too much of a product, it drops the price yeah. all over the market. Yeah. Wow. Didn't think you were getting some economics in this episode of Physics Twist, but there you go. Twistonomics. Yeah. Twistonomics. Twistonomics. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're encroaching on another another well-known podcast <laughs> territory there. Which I listen yeah. to. <laughs> yeah, me too. It's great. <laughs> um, so I also wanted to talk about how the number of rhinos being killed by poachers has increased quite dramatically over the last 10 years. Um, So this tends to go in cyclical sort of uh, nature. So it has a a big re-emergence and it sort of dwindles away for a bit and it comes back. So in 2007, there were just 13 uh, rhinos killed in Africa. Uh, That's jumped up to 1,028 rhinos in 2017. Whoa. So that equals roughly three rhinos killed each day. Oh, wow. That's horrible. That is pretty horrific, actually. That is a lot. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So continue on just with Pembian. They're now pursuing some uh, novel funding strategies to try and get their horns into the market Mm -hmm. um, because they still haven't actually released their horns yet. Uh, One of the things that they did try and do to get their funding was they introduced a cryptocurrency. Oh, my uh, God. And they called that cryptocurrency Pembicoin. 
Now, the coin offering is an effort to fund research into the biofabricated horns and gauge customer demand. Um, so for every coin that's purchased now, the buyer of that coin earns one gram of rhino horn once they become available in 2022. Oh my god. Mm. This is the most futuristic thing I've ever heard. It's pretty cool. That is really crazy. Do you think they'd be able to print human teeth? Yes, and I believe they do. That's pretty cool. Really? Um, I think the issue with 3D printing human teeth, though, is human teeth are alive. And mm. you need to... You can't really 3D print that at the yeah. moment. That technology is still advancing. Mm -hmm. um, so what they can do is they can 3D print scaffolds yep. of teeth. And they can kind of grow into them. And I think there's a lot of research being done into that yeah, area. Cool. And the horns are alive, quote-unquote, in a sense as well, aren't they? Or at least at the base. I think. At the base. While yeah. they're on the the rhino or the tusk on the elephant, they are alive. Yeah. But once you cut them off, that's, that's it. I think it's also similar to, say, like... Like a dog's thing, like a dog's claws. If you, mm, they, they have, have that base part where it's like it's got a quick where they still feel it, and that's kind of the base and maybe halfway up, and then at the tip is kind of the deader a bit. Yeah, I think it doesn't. They don't have as much feeling at the end. Where it's hard. Yeah. And effectively. Well, actually, like, a quick experiment to show this is if you put your thumb out and mm -hmm. you press you, your other fingernail into the top of your thumbnail. Mm -hmm. now, if you do it near the very end, mm -hmm. how much do you feel? It's, I can feel the pressure. A little bit. You feel yeah. the pressure mainly underneath it, though. Yeah. But as you start to get towards the base of your nail, can you start to actually feel yeah, it a feel little it bit a sharper more. now? I feel it less. Really? Yeah. Quill, you're broken. <laughs> <laughs> Why? My God. Are you a human? Maybe not. Or a cyborg? So, as so, as someone's as 3D Quill printed said, Quill. <laughs> with the dogs, as you get down to the quick, yeah. they've got more nerve endings there. Yeah. It's the same as us. If you get down towards the quick, yeah. that's where it's growing. Hmm. I might want to get that checked. <laughs> you also notice, here's another experiment. Rusty, if I, if I just pull out one of your teeth, oh, you'll that feel... Hurts down there. <laughs> Maybe it just needs to be pushed a bit harder. <laughs> <laughs> just get rusty. Yeah. All right, what were you saying? Sorry, Duncan. I was just going to say, if I pull out your teeth, you'll also feel that yeah. quite a lot. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I would imagine so. Please don't do it's, that. It's the nerve endings. Oh, <laughs> put my flyers my down. <laughs> what about the listeners, Rusty? <laughs> it's for science. It's for science. Body on the it's, line. It's, trust me, I'm a scientist. <laughs> yeah. Trust me, I'm a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just imagining like Zoidberg. <laughs> um, we digress. Yes, we do indeed. Um, yeah, I think what, it's really interesting story, especially about the Pembient part. Russell, but I think um, there's a problem here in the this has been doing a lot of rounds in the media lately talking about the white rhino specifically, but so many species are going extinct yeah. all the time and no one cares about them mm. at all. There's just like they don't get any sort of media coverage whatsoever, probably because they're, say, a peculiar type of South American insect or something like that. But um, as the sort of destruction of the environment continues, it's just going to happen more and more and more. So I think we need to be a bit more aware of this and, and communicating the impacts of that. Absolutely. And we don't know what the follow-on effects are. I mean, mm. for one, it's bad enough just to lose any animal species um, in general. But secondly, you know, you don't know what that animal species role plays in the in the whole circle of life. <laughs> Excuse yeah. the term, but like, you know, you don't know if that bug dies, that bug is feeding this, that this and this and this and where that leads to and mm. what kind of disasters are coming from that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah, we yeah. should nip it in the bug before we create a, a problem that we can't come back from. Exactly. Kind of like that. Have you guys heard of that um, climate change? Yeah. That? Yeah, that. yeah. I see it in the news all the time. Yeah. That sounds like it could be really bad. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what that is. Do you know much about that? <laughs> Maybe we'll do it. We'll do an episode on it. We should. Just, just for you, Rusty. We Excellent. should do that one. Yeah, we should. I'm sure that we will. Yeah. yeah. Shotgun being involved. All right. You've been in two of the four episodes so far, so... That's because I like talking. You're my, you're my mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it turns out that, like, in that your thing is, you know, fixing things and 3D printing. Apparently mine is... Is space stations because this is the second story that I've, I'll be doing on space stations. Um, there is a it's Chinese. Because you need a lot of space. I do. I need personal space. For the listeners that can't see, Duncan's very tall. Yeah. So he needs some space. So I'm so far away from the microphone. Maybe it's because you're closer to space that you're so yeah, interested exactly. in satellites it's and so such. So cold up here. <laughs> um, there is a space station run by the Chinese called the Tiangong One. 
Yeah, apologize if I'm <laughs> mispronouncing that, but that's my um, my best go. Uh, that was launched in 2011 to serve as a manned laboratory and basically a test bed for future um, research into space technology for the Chinese. Yeah. Um, things like orbital rendezvous and um, docking, that sort of thing, because they haven't quite got the. I guess they you know haven't quite got the hang of that, so they're looking into it with this Changong one. Quill, please stop. <laughs> Hey. <laughs> You're distracting me. I know. Um, yes, so that's been up there since 2011. It was supposed to be... <clears throat> um, the, the term that I read was deorbited. supposed to be deorbited in 2013. Deorbited basically means crashed into Earth. Yep, um, into but the, deliberately. Deliberately crashed into, yeah. into the Earth in 2013. Um, but it wasn't. They extended its lifespan by two years so that they can continue doing their research, which is which is pretty cool. Um, the Chang'e one cool. is also notable because it featured um, missions from the first two female Chinese astronauts, which is really awesome. Awesome. Yeah, they got to get up there. Currently, the Chang Changong is still up there. Um, it's at 290 kilometres up in the sky, travelling at roughly 29,000 kilometres per hour. Um, just for reference, um, it's currently at 290 kilometres up in the sky. It used to be a little bit higher, and that's because it is deorbiting. It's mm. coming back down. So that means it'll actually crash in early April. But, get this, no one really knows where it's going to land. Mm. Now, this thing weighs eight and a half tonnes. So does that mean they don't have control of it anymore? No, they lost control of it. So in 2016, at some point, um, they effectively lost control. And this is the Chinese National Space Agency. They lost control of it and kind of didn't tell anyone. Mm, um, okay. But some amateur astronomers were, huh. were observing it and, and went, hey guys, I don't think you've got this anymore. And they had to admit to the public that, oh, they, wow. did, that they indeed didn't have control of it anymore. Um, and it's just been floating up there ever since. So um, it will it will come down apparently in the next couple of weeks. Um, it could land almost anywhere on Earth. Most likely it'll be uh, in the ocean somewhere. But it is possible that it could actually land somewhere in Tasmania. So watch out for space junk. Watch out for space junk. Or wow. it could land in New Zealand. When I say it, really I'm talking about sort of chunks of it. Yeah. Because most of it will be burnt up in the atmosphere. Yeah. But chunks of up to 100 kilograms could actually reach it to the Earth's surface. Not a small amount. Not a small amount. But good news, um, according to the Aerospace Corporation, which I've recently learned is a thing, um, the chances of being struck by falling debris from a sp spacecraft are one million times smaller than the odds of that person winning the jackpot in the Powerball lottery. Buy a lottery ticket. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, did you say how high the Tiangong one is? Yeah, 290 kilometres up. Okay. So, so to put that in perspective, that is just a few kilometres more than the distance between Sydney and Canberra. Wow. So if you take that horizontal distance and, and put it vertically, it up. it's just going to be about four kilometres further. Really? Oh. Not far. But yes, very far. No, it's not that far. <laughs> you mean four kilometres, isn't it? Or 290 kilometres? 290 kilometres. It's not that far. It's like popping over to Canberra, except you're popping up into up space. Into space. I, actually, I think that's pretty far. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, um, guys, if you are listening to this in, say, late April, um, hopefully you didn't get hit by a piece of um, falling space debris. But if you're listening to it before <laughs> then, then just watch out. Do you remember when Mir came down? you remember the Russian space station Mir? Do you remember that? Uh, yes, I do remember that. Yeah, I think it came, in, Vaguely. It came down in 2001 or so. So mm. it's I was just old enough to sort of remember it. But I actually remember seeing it in the sky. Coming, oh, wow. Yeah. Did you not see that? No, I don't awesome. recall actually watching yeah. that. It came down at night time in, oh. um, you know, in Australian That's pretty cool. Eastern Standard Time, and you could actually see it sort of piercing across the sky. It was awesome, really fast and really bright. Yeah, wow. so what year was that? I think it was 2001. Um, okay. Again, future Duncan might chime in. Nice one, guys, Duncan. It was indeed 2001. Back to you in the studio. 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 Um, yeah, so, so long Tiangong One. It's been a pleasure. We hardly farewell. knew you. Yeah, farewell. Mm. See you later. Safe journey home. So, well, it won't be. Anyway, so, um, <laughs> now on to, we have, uh, we do want to talk this week about some sadder news uh, in the scientific world, which is um, that Stephen Hawking passed away mm. a couple of days very ago. Sad. Very, very sad. Very sad. Um, so, a lot of people think of Stephen Hawking as being the smart guy in the wheelchair who invented time or something. Um, but that's, you know, not quite 
Not quite, right? Um, so just for anyone who isn't fully across what he's been responsible for, he was effectively sort of, I guess you could say sort of standing on the shoulders of giants in terms of building upon what other scientists before him did. So um, things like Isaac Newton effectively described the force of gravity, but he didn't actually explain how it worked. He didn't basically said, I don't know how this works. I'm just saying it exists. Then Einstein says, this is how it works. And it's not so much that there is a force being exerted by objects um, onto other objects. It's more that um, gravity is a property of space itself. And then Hawking came along and said that it is possible for there to be such a thing as a singularity and effectively proved it in, I think, 1970 with a guy called Roger Penrose, who is alive and with us, which is great. Um, and that's effectively where his career really, really took off. So looking into the singularity and, and black holes, which are described as um, sort of the Big Bang in reverse. Um, and after that, yeah, all of his work sort of revolved around black holes and did a lot of work into... Um, popularizing science as well so i think that's more his main his main legacy because there's been a lot mm. of fantastic cosmologists and astrophysicists in the sort of first half of the in the 20th century who maybe um c contributed more than stephen hawking did to this to this to these fields but um stephen hawking's main contribution is probably in in promoting science and scientific yeah. um literacy ironically i almost couldn't remember the word for that but yes scientific literacy um so yeah that's going to be his his legacy i think um do you guys have any other thoughts so i actually wanted to ask you guys what is the one thing that you think of as the most memorable about stephen hawking well that's the thing it has to be things like his episode on the simpsons right that was mine <laughs> yeah i i loved his uh robot voice mm -hmm. yeah. and that was that voice was made for him quite early in his life. Yeah. Um, when he stopped being able to talk. Yeah. Was it and by IBM? He, by IBM. Yeah. Mm. And he deliberately kept that voice because he felt that that was who he was. Yeah. Mm. So even once better text to voice um, programs were available, he still kept that voice mm. because that was part of his identity. Yeah, it's yeah. fantastic, and it's. It's kind of funny because it has an American accent, but he's not American. He's now, to do with that voice, I think I've actually got something that can replicate it. Oh, yeah? So, okay. I've just managed to find it out <laughs> on my computer here. Make it Rusty say something. loves apps. Yeah. <laughs> Make it say something Hello, about physics twist. my name is Rusty. <laughs> That's pretty good. That's a little bit creepy. It is a little bit <laughs> creepy. And it sounds a little bit too deep, to be honest. Yeah. So, I don't think it's quite accurate. There might be some stuff out there, and... Actually, in saying that, his original voice, apparently it hasn't been able to be replicated exactly by anything other than the original, um, the circuits that made up that wow. voice replicator. Because it's yeah, wow. literally a synthesizer, an analog yeah. synthesizer. Um, and, you, and you would think that with Stephen Hawking being a, a physicist and, and quite popular and in the condition he was, that he would love technology. Mm. He was actually quite opposed to technology. In fact, he avoided upgrading his uh, wheelchair for as long as possible. Mm. Uh, and it was only later in his life that um, there were some scientists that convinced him that he could uh, move his wheelchair and be able to talk by using a, a sensor pointed at his eye. Mm. So if you look at the most recent photos of Stephen Hawking, you'll see that over his right eye, there's a little tiny sense that sticks out from his, his glasses. Mm. And he avoided using that for so long until yeah, it became yeah. absolutely necessary. Oh, wow. Okay. Before that, he was using a, um, a joystick of sorts, wasn't he? Yeah. 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 Crazy. Um, my favourite story about Stephen Hawking, he, um, he held a party and owned, well, for, he held a party for time travellers but he only announced it the day after the party. <laughs> <laughs> no one turned up. <laughs> that's, and that's, uh, that that's effectively the fantastic thing about him. Time travel. Um, also, like, despite like you know what he was going through, he had an awesome sense of humor, mm. which you can see in his things like being in The Simpsons, and he was in lots of popular culture things doing that kind of thing, where he really represented science in a good way, but showed that you can be super smart but still be fun and like do a lot of cool things, which yeah. obviously for us as scientists, communicators is really important and good yeah. that people see that you can do this kind of stuff and still have a good sense of humor all right well guys that is a wrap on physics twist for this week 
So again, thank you, Rusty. Thank you, Quill, for joining me. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, it's been a pleasure. Always a pleasure, never a chore, as I like to say. Um, and to our listeners, don't forget that you can meet the wonderful people of physics at your school, vacation care, or birthday party. Just go to physicseducation.com.au. That is F-I-Z-Z-I-C-S, education.com.au. Also, if you like this episode, you can rate us on iTunes. It really, really helps us out. Uh, we'll be back next week, hopefully, uh, with another of our educators from physics. Um, also, you can listen to the podcast from our managing director, the lovely Ben Newsom, if you're into more science education type things. All right, great. Thanks. Awesome. Catch you next week. See you.